Hi, I'm Rick Cup from Pepperdine Law School, and I have the great honor of moderating our next session. Our next session addresses significant and or interesting potential legal conflicts related to laboratory animals that may arise in the coming years. And knowing a little bit about what our panelists are going to address, I promise you that we will be hearing about potential future legal issues that are both interesting and significant. Our first speaker is uh, Gerald Tannenbaum, Professor Emeritus of the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, where he taught required courses in veterinary law and ethics from 1999 through 2013. Professor Tannenbaum. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be address addressing um, one of the most <coughs> comprehensive, difficult, contentious, and important questions facing laboratory animal law now and in the future. Uh, it's also an old question, not as old as Ecclesiastes, to be sure, but in the history of animal research, really, really quite old. And that question is this. Should federal law allow or require higher cooks to engage in ethical review of animal research projects? Or, alternative formulation, should federal law re regard high folks as ethics committees? Now, those of us who were around in 1985 <coughs> know how Congress answered this question. But some of us clearly were not around in those days. Um, and the question has emerged again. What I'm going to try to do is to talk a bit about the nature of ethical review, current federal statutory law, how Congress answered the question in 1985, why the question has emerged, and some problems and issues. Because of time constraints, I am not able to show you the entirety of my breathtaking and logically airtight presentation. <laughs> However, there is a PDF that has been posted on the agenda for the workshop and that will be posted in the Learn More that has all of my fabulous slides on it. And so you need to take uh, crummy pictures with your cell phones. Uh, you'll have them all. And I also want to apologize for having to zoom through some of this material. It will not look terrific, but in the interest of time and, and my being spared very grim looks from the uh, moderators, I have to do this. Now, this I have to show you. Uh, I can't show this slide anymore to students because, believe it or not, they don't know who this was. <laughs> but some of us remember Richard Nixon, who used to say, among other things, let me make something perfectly clear. So I want to make some things perfectly clear before I start. In my view, and in the view of many of us in the community and in this room, Animal research is a necessary tool in preventing, alleviating, and curing human and animal disease. There is enormous agreement <coughs> in the research community about ethics, about ethically appropriate aims of animal research, and about what methods are and are not ethically appropriate. And the vast majority of animal research projects are conducted for ethically sound reasons and in ethically appropriate ways. So the need to, to consider the issue uh, that I'm raising uh, this afternoon does not imply that there are widespread and serious and intractable ethical problems with animal research, nor does it imply that I, Cooks, or anyone else should be legally required to engage in ethical review of animal research. Congress said they shouldn't. Here's a hypothetical scenario I want to raise, and then I'll try to refer to it through the presentation and what's left of it, and then we can come back to it toward the end because it's important. Imagine that I Cooks were to be allowed or required by federal law to reject animal research projects they find to be ethically inappropriate or to require modifications in project aims or procedures in order to comport with what they regard as ethical requirements. It's not now the case. Imagine it were. Imagine that you are an IACUC member at an American university and that the IACUC is presented with the following proposal. The proposed experiment 
will simulate first-hand cigarette smoking. By the way, this is not so hypothetical, so you may know. In rhesus monkeys, to examine whether various new potential therapeutic agents can alleviate or reverse resulting emphysema in these animals and ultimately in humans. Emphysema of different levels of severity will be induced in different monkeys, and selected agents will be administered in various dosages to determine their effectiveness in alleviating or reversing symptoms of disease. I'm going to depart from the slides now to talk a bit about uh, ethical review, limited ethical review, and scientific, uh, and limited scientific review, which I do have in the slides. Ethical review would be synonymous with full or complete ethical review. And if I folks, were to engage in ethical review, as I'm defining it, you may do, it would be able to assess and reject or approve all aspects of an animal research project, including its aims or goals. We also have, in fact, what can be called limited ethical review, in which an eye cook would apply a more limited ethical principle uh, in its assessment of animal research. And eye cooks now do this in requiring investigators to demonstrate there are no alternative means that would cause the animals less distress or pain, the eye cook is applying an ethical principle. The three R's state an ethical principle. But it's limited ethical review because the eye cook is not engaged in a complete ethical review of the proposal. Put another way, the eye cook does not, and according to Congress, should not, uh, consider whether that the research is justified on ethical grounds. Scientific review, or full scientific review, or what the NIH calls review of scientific and technical merit, would involve the scientific evaluation of the scientific soundness of a procedure, including its aims and goals, and limited scientific review would involve a scientific assessment of a portion of a portion of the project. Now, full ethical review requires scientific ethical review. Why is that? And I have a beautiful slide that summarizes it. It's because, given or assuming that the aims of a project, let's say the hypothetical emphysema study, Assume that the project, the aims of the project, are ethically appropriate if the procedures that are being proposed are scientifically crummy, to use a technical word, or if the investigator does not have the background or expertise to do the project properly, then that project cannot be justified on ethical grounds because the animals are not being experimented in a way that could result in the achievement of the aims. And this is a very, very important point, that full ethical review must require some amount of scientific review, because one of the problems with Iacocks Cooks is not really a problem, but one of the facts about Iacocks Cooks that Congress, in fact, recognized was that they are not experts in scientific merit review, the NIH study review groups are, and they are not qualified to engage in the kinds of scientific review that are part of ethical review. Having said that, let me zoom through some of the slides. In the hypothetical emphysema study, suppose the IACUC is considering whether the investigator can consistently with the scientific aims of the project reduce the pain or distress the monkeys might experience by modifying the proposed restraint procedures by not using restraint chairs. This would be limited ethical review. Suppose the eye is considering whether it is ethically acceptable to simulate first-hand smoking and cause pain and distress in monkeys as a sensitive species to develop drugs that might alleviate or cure resulting emphysema. This would be ethical review. There's a tremendous difference between these two kinds of review. And Congress, quite clearly, and both the U.S. and the and, and OLA have recognized 
that IACUCs not only can but must you know, be involved in the first kind of ethical review, but the second kind of ethical review is different. Okay. Here's an example of why scientific review is an important part of full ethical review. If monkeys are not a good model for human emphysema, the product is ethically unacceptable. There's no reason to use the monkeys. If monkeys are a good model, but the proposed cigarette smoking simulation procedures are unlikely to induce the desired level of severity of emphysema, the project is ethically unacceptable. If monkeys are a good model, the proposed procedures are appropriate, but the investigator lacks sufficient funding and facilities to undertake the project properly, the project is ethically unacceptable. So this is about, about to tell you what Congress uh, thought it was saying in 1985 um, at the time of the amendments of the Animal Welfare Act and of that portion of the HRVA, uh, which deals with the animal research uh, funded by the NIH. And in the appendix in the PDF, I have statutory uh, provisions that will make this clearer. IACOCs may not permit uh, engage in ethical review. They may not evaluate the aims or general character of project on ethical grounds. IACOCs may not engage in scientific merit review. They may not assess the scientific quality of project aims or, or of the technical procedures intended to achieve these aims. They do engage in limited ethical review. They must assure compliance with a number of legally mandated ethical principles, such as the reduction or elimination of pain or distress consistent with project aims. And they do engage in some kind of limited scientific review because in the case of that principle, they have to assure themselves that the procedures that the investigator is proposing, in fact, comport with that requirement. And this is a statement that Congress made that some of you may find shocking, but it's a very, very important part of the legislative history. Those of us who were there, there, or who were consulting with people who were there in 1985 know that Congress was very, very reluctant to pass the amendments to the Animal Welfare Act and the portions of the HRA that deal with this because they were worried that the committees would meddle with the projects. The committees would say, this is not good, this is bad, this is not ethically appropriate. And they, the Congress people, the senators and the representatives made it very, very clear. And this is stated in the legislative history, the published legislative history. The animal care committees have no authority to interfere with research decisions, goals, or methods. The committees have no authority to second guess or review the appropriateness of research. The authority of the committees is limited to review of the care and treatment of animals pursuant to guidelines established by the NIH. Now, I know that there are people who have problems with this, and they have wondered ever since 1985 whether it's possible to isolate animal welfare considerations uh, from ethical considerations. But in fact, in 1985, after the president signed, signed these uh, bills, a spate of law review and other articles came out protesting that uh, the, the IACOS ought to engage in ethical review, and there were others who, who disputed that. There is also language in, in, uh, from APHIS and, and in the Animal Welfare Act that reinforced this notion. But present, there's a void. There is an ethical void. Um, IACOCs may not engage in full ethical review, and they don't have the expertise to engage in the kinds of scientific review that are relevant to full ethical review. Now, the scientific review groups at the NIH, which of course are restricted to, uh, to looking at grant applications, and not all animal research falls into that category, they are qualified. They are qualified to do the scientific merit review. And part of that involves looking at the goals, the medical goals and scientific goals. And so in a certain way, much of what they do is a kind of ethical consideration. But they don't involve themselves in the very broad ethical question, which is, is the use of animals and what is done to the animals justified by the proposed results of the experiment? That is the fundamental ethical question that the NIH SRGs do not getting wrong. Right now, federal statutory law does not allocate the task of comprehensive and sustained ethical review of animal research projects to anyone. Now why is this question back? Why are we 
worried about this now. We are. Well, first of all, is an ethical void, review void uh, acceptable at a time when, when we are so concerned about ethics in general and science and animal research in particular? Is this the right approach? Shouldn't somebody be looking in a sustained way, in a complete way, at the ethics of animal research projects? Again, slides are all available on the PDF. What about public support? It's already been noted, and I have some materials in my, my PDF, that public support is not impressive and may be waning. Might an ethical review by IACO <coughs> promote public support? Law in other countries requires ethical review in the UK and the EU. And in both of these uh, jurisdictions, the EU more than one jurisdiction, any harm done to the animals in research project must be justified by the likely benefits. And this is uh, a very important kind of ethical question. The Eighth Edition of the Guide, this famous paragraph in the Guide that, that we're all aware of, in which the, the, the authors of the Guide have declared that in certain circumstances, when, for example, there's the potential for unrelief pain or distress or other animal welfare concerns, the IQ is obligated, obliged to weigh the objectives of the study against the potential animal welfare concerns. This is a straightforwardly full ethical question, a question of full ethical review. And then research community acceptance. AIC has endorsed this provision and has talked about um, harm benefit analysis and the need for harm benefit analysis. And I just want to point out quickly in passing that when Chris Newcomer says that I have cooks already doing this because they're looking at the three R's, the three R's and the application of the three R's are not the same as full ethical review. Because we can have a project, let's suppose a hypothetical monkey study, where in fact, where in fact pain or distress is minimized and one can still ask questions about whether that project is ethically appropriate. It's not the same thing. Okay. We have the joint working group of ALAS and Philatso published a report that many of you I know are familiar with. And at uh, conferences, criminal conferences, score conferences, harm benefit analysis is a routine or common issue. And then we have OLA. Um, OLA has, in fact, by endorsing and incorporating the guide, endorse and incorporate that provision of the guide that calls for the weighing of objectives against welfare concerns. And there is direct language from OLA uh, in which um, ethical review is endorsed and indeed required. And much of this comes from the famous principle two in the US principles which are part of the public health service policy in which IACUCs are required to evaluate the relevance of procedure to human or animal health, the advancement of knowledge, or the good of society. That's ethical review. That's full ethical review. And also in which the public health service policy talks about the IACUC looking at sound research designs and scientific valuable research. Now, I explain in detail in my PDF, and some of the slides you will not see, how this happened, how OLA came to include these provisions in the legislative history. And I've written about this in a book chapter that I've referred to that you can look at that documents what happened and why this happened. But in any event, now that it has happened, and now that so many of the research community are endorsing not only full ethical review, but what's called harm benefit analysis, which in my not so humble opinion is a disaster, which I'll talk about briefly. We must think about this. Okay. Here are some problems. I actually get through this in my allotted time. The vast majority of I Cook members are not qualified to engage in kinds of scientific merit review that are relevant to ethical review. They're just not. Ernest Prentice claims that they are, but he's wrong. They just are not. The vast majority of IACUC members do not have extensive knowledge of or background in animal ethics or bioethics. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know much about science. Um, but this is a problem if committees are to engage in full ethical review. 
the ethical principles that have been proposed so far for full ethical review are not well established. And the best example of this is this so-called harm-benefit analysis that requires an IACUC, when it looks at a project, before it's done, to determine whether any harms done to the animals are justified, justified ethically, ethically, by the likely benefits. Well, that, that just can't be. Because so much scientific research cannot predict what the results will be at the time it's proposed or even started. And then what will this do to basic research, which at the time it's proposed and begun, cannot promise benefits of any kind? Um, and a careful look um, at harm-benefit analysis, which I do in my chapter, and I refer that to you, shows that it is deeply, deeply flawed um, and needs to be carefully considered before it's thrust on the research community. And those of you who are involved in research, think about um, now, I mean, it's easy to say. I've seen thousands of IACUC applications having served on IACUCs, in which uh, investigators will say, well, here it is. We're going to get the cure for this, the prevention of this, and so forth and so on. But how many of you can actually predict with reasonable scientific cert certitude or certainty or anything that there will be likely benefits and the proposed likely benefits? It can't happen. Now, that's not to say that this demand or, or, or uh, hope for likely benefits is not understandable and is not ethically motivated because if one is going to be harming animals, and not all experiments clearly do, but if one is going to be causing them at least pain and distress, many people will say, oh, what for? What do you hope to gain from them? And now, there are difficult issues. I do believe, as I've said, that uh, regarding most questions and issues, I'll make it. Regarding most questions and issues, people in the research community are in agreement. But there are contentious and difficult issues. Um, and there's going to be inconsistencies and disagreements about certain kinds of research so that different eye cooks will come to different conclusions. So here's our proposed experiment. And here's our first eye cook. It's fun. As proposed, uh, many people around the world uh, smoke and suffer emphysema. Go with the monkey. The second guy cook, or I cook in another institution, says, no, no, you can't use monkeys for this because we already have an effective way of preventing emphysema induced by cigarettes. Just stop smoking. That'll, that'll do it. So you don't have to use monkeys. Now, I'm not making fun of this. This is a, an arguable position. It really is. As is the first one. That's the point I'm making. These are ethically arguable positions. Now, a third I cook. Rejects monkey studies of first or second hand. Oh, this, oh, this, this first um, second eye book is going to say it will allow second hand study using monkeys, but not first hand, because first hand the people are responsible themselves, and but second hand is no fault of their own. They have the cigarette induced emphysema. The third one rejects monkey studies of the first or second hand smoke as unethical on the grounds that non human primates should not be used in any kind of tobacco research, but says using mice is fine with them. And the last I put in this hypothetical will say, um, no, only secondhand smoke and so forth. Now, these are, these are important and interesting ethical disagreements. And you can well imagine I cooks at different institutions having different answers. And what do we do? If uh, one I cook says you have to use mice, and another one says the monkeys are OK, and the other one says secondhand smoke, you've got to change your proposal, there will be chaos uh, and inconsistency and movement, perhaps, of investigators. Not good. Um, and there are other kinds of issues one can think of also. We use certain other species, like dogs and cats and so forth and so on. I was the chair of an eye cook at a major, um, major medical school eye cook, uh, eye cook here in, uh, in the Boston area. We had a member, an affiliated member, who was a cat veterinarian, and she would not approve anything. Well, she had some argument. So the point then is, what are we going to do about all of this? Do we need regulations from APHIS and OLA or from a joint new um, regulatory body to settle ethical disagreements? Will they? And if they settle them, how will they do it? Do we need a standing national body that's been pro proposed by some commentators, a committee in Washington, that would um, promulgate standards and adjudicate issues? What about some academic bioethicists who would provide guidance? 
Some of my best friends are academic biologists, but most of them don't like animal research. Is that what you would want? Something else, including leaving things as they are now. So here are some messages for you, and then I'll stop. We must be very careful before allowing or requiring eye cooks to engage in full ethical review. Valuable research could be precluded or hindered if problematic ethical standards are imposed, as they could be. Federal agencies must not exceed their statutory authority. We're going to need statutory changes and careful consideration by Congress before we open ethical review to eye hooks. All potential dangers of various approaches should be considered. And we should not allow this understandable desire to eliminate the ethics review void to threaten research that can improve the health and welfare of humans and animals. The point I'm trying to make is that what some people are finding perfectly obvious, namely that I took should and must involve it be involved in global ethical review, is before us. It will be increasingly before us for the future of animal law as the public becomes even more interested in animal welfare and Sadly, I think more of them become skeptical of, of, of animal research. And so it's a but it's a question that we need to be very, very careful and involved in um, and reopen uh, as we consider the future of uh, laboratory animal. Oh. Thank you. I am pleased to be able to introduce also our second speaker, uh, Nathan Herschler, who's the executive director of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society and its educational affiliate, the Ethical Science Education Coalition. All right. Uh, thank you all for hanging in there a little bit. Uh, it's the end of the day, or getting closer to the end of the day. Uh, thank you to everybody who's on the uh, webinar as well, including my mom, who's been texting me. Please don't for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, <laughs> thank you to thank you to Harvard and everybody, all the hosts for the for the presentation. I also want to give a special thanks uh, and shout out to. Dr. Copaldo uh, needs his president emeritus, to Delcy, to Sue Leary at ARDF, um, and to Chris Berry at ALDF, uh, who all gave some really valuable insight into my preparation for this presentation. Um, I wanted to uh, start with a little bit about who Neves is and what that actually means. Um, so as you can tell from our name, uh, we exist our mission is to move society as quickly as possible towards the end of the use of animals in research. And this is an image from one of our earliest newsletters uh, published in 1915 for distribution to our membership. And it stated that Neves opposes the contention of vivisectors, implied or expressed that it's no one's business what happens to animals, uh, so long as the individual who's handling it can plead that to increase science was his aim. Since that time, Science and law have caught up with this contention a bit, and passage of laws such as the AWA and, and establishment of the PHS policy, as my co-panelist noted in his article, Ethics and Pain Research in Animals, there you are, hello, sir, that our society has agreed that ethical treatment of animals is not just morally obligatory, it's required by law. And so uh, we also see outside of the law that society is increasingly recognizing that animals po possess remarkable cognitive and emotional capacities. Uh, decades of research have shown that many animals have the capacity for conscious experience, emotions, sensitivity to reward and punishment, and even self-recognition. Those ways that we've traditionally defined ourselves as people and distinct from other animals are slowly falling away as science documents these capacities. And our norms as a society and global society shift to embrace the complexity and, dare I say, potential rights of those non-human animals. So all of us have accomplished a lot since 1915 when this article came out, but also very little. Another section of this first uh, journal article of Living Tissue voiced fear from our opposition at the time that women's suffrage would bring an end to both war and vivisection. So I'm pleased to report that we have uh, achieved women's suffrage, although we saw through last week's coverage uh, uh, of the Women's March that we still have a long way to go towards achieving any sort of equality there. But suffrage did not result in the end of war or vivisection. We've argued about vivisection across world wars, across the Great Depression, the New Deal, the Civil Rights Movement, the rise of the Animal Rights Movement, and the drafting and passing of the Animal Welfare Act, and the line drawing that that represented, and all the way to today. 
Um, I wanted to speak today as NEED's new executive director and state that all of us in this room do have a lot in common. We can stand on the platform of science together. We all want to witness the end of cancer, of inherited diseases, and more. I'm confident that everybody here would happily replace their animal tests with alternatives when they believe there's alternatives there to, uh, that have been adequately validated. And I believe that most labs in the U.S. think and do care about the welfare of their animals and their care. And I believe that many researchers have a personal ethical framework, as we've heard today from a number of you, that includes a respect for animals, and that many of you in the room have companion animals that you love like family. And I do believe that there's room for us to sit down and dialogue about what's working and what isn't with the current laws. And there's room for us to sit and think through some of these really complicated ethical and legal framework challenges um, that may help guide decision making around some of uh, the most innovative tools we've started to hear a bit about today. Uh, and we'll learn more about in the future. So I'm really, really thankful to be able to be here today and chat with some of you. And just to note again that we're here to problem solve. Um, my substantive presentation is going to start with a number of areas where we're likely to disagree with one another and then conclude with the ways in which we'd like to work together moving forward. Um, and oops, we do have a lot to disagree over. Um, I'm going to cover this section just really briefly because Delcy handled it really nicely earlier. Um, uh, and uh, I want to uh, also um, note to Steve and his recommendation earlier that there's, um, there's substantial room for us to get to some level of agreement and certainly room for us to come to the table on some of these issues um, as, he, as he presented earlier. Um, so just very quickly, again, on the FACEB report that came out here, we understand as, a, as an organization, and I think in the animal rights community, that there is a regulatory burden associated with compliance. I myself have had the joy of drafting and being in compliance with USAID and the State Department um, as part of some of the conservation projects that I have used to work on. And I, like you, wish that burden imposed on those who, who was, uh, was lower. Um, but I do understand, as I think you all do, that why those compliance systems are in place. I do believe that the, the recommendations coming out of this report were far, put far too much focus on um, reducing administration and, and bureaucracy at the expense of animal welfare. Um, and this is some of our key areas of concern. <clears throat> um, and I won't belabor this much more, um, other than to say that the face of the report itself highlighted that uh, quote, providing exceptional welfare to, is paramount when conducting animal research. And regulatory requirements are vital to ensuring that research is executed safely, ethically, and humanely. I do think that there, that there are a number of provisions in this report itself, and, and if those are starting to be the framework for future regulatory reform by the government, I think that there's going to be some serious challenges from the animal welfare and animal rights communities. Um, as that regulation gets re reviewed and refined. Um, but I think that if we can come together with a set of new approaches and novel approaches, potentially the ones that were recommended earlier by including the animals such as rats, mice, and birds in exchange for a reduction of, of some of the regulatory burden, I think that's enough to get all of these diverse stakeholders to the table really substantially. So again, thank you for making that type of recommendation. <clears throat> Um, I also won't spend on time on this, but additionally, um, I think as most of you guys are aware, we would also be opposed to um, some of the challenges that we had this past year associated with transparency and APHIS third-party investigations proposals um, that, are, that are in listening session right now. So um, I do want to spend most of my time talking about the possible legal implications of some of these novel technologies. Uh, I'm going to start with some conversations about the regulation of human-animal chimera, which is reflected by a really interesting petition um, submitted a few years ago to, uh, by ALDF, um, and then move in some of, to some of the same types of ethical considerations that um, Ken was talking about earlier associated with CRISPR, um, and then hopefully move into how we can move forward effectively together. So the word chimera itself, since we haven't heard this term yet today, uh, it dates back to the 14th century, where it was used to refer to a fire-breathing monster of Greek mythology. Um, but in modern times, it refers to an organism with at least two populations of genetically distinct cells originating originating from different individual zygotes. Um, I had to look up almost every word in that definition as a non-scientist, uh, but I think I get it now. Um, the creation of human-animal chimeras created by transplanting, transplanting human cells into animal recipients is morally and politically controversial. 
Uh, researchers believe that these types of chimeras are, are valuable research tools due to the possible application of the technology for human benefits, including evaluating the potential for those chimeras to grow cells, tissues, uh, and organs suitable for transplantation into humans, uh, studying in vivo biological development, um, and testing therapies and cures for human diseases. Chimeric animals with implanted human brain cells have already shown evidence of improved cognitive capacity, most famously represented in it by Han et al. Um, and in this study, uh, they've, they've, they had findings indicating that mice grafted with these human glial progenitor cells had increased mental capacity, um, and it led to a publication of a lot of bioethical articles, um, two of which were uh, by Green and Greeley, who both agreed that such experiments should be subject to careful oversight because those procedures could possibly increase the cognitive capacity in ways that would be morally significant to those animals. Neither article participated in any sort of uh, line drawing exercise to indicate precisely what that increased capacity may signify, or more imp importantly, when it would become morally significant. And this is important ethically because the common justification for human interests trumping animal interests is that humans have more or more complex interests than animals. They're either not as smart, not as rational, not as sentient, or something, some combination of those, those types of criteria. And since this study, a number of other articles have been published showing the risk of having little or no regulation over modified human beings, or, excuse me, chimera. Um, uh, in this article, um, we saw that within one year, the human glial progenitor cells in newborn, in newborn mice pup brains were almost entirely displaced, resulting in mice with a totally humanized uh, glial progenitor population. Now, they did not do any sort of cognitive testing in this example, um, uh, but I think more importantly, in an article uh, in New Scientist, where this, where this article was being discussed by the authors, the team decided, uh, talked about how they decided not to try to put human cells into uh, monkey brains. They decided uh, there were too many potential ethical issues with that. And Ennard, one of the other co-authors, agreed that it could be difficult to decide which animals to put human brain cells into, because if you make animals more human-like, where do you stop? <clears throat> so where do you stop indeed? Um, the comment from Dr. Ennard uh, really highlights the slippery slope argument that we're trying to work through and think through here. Um, and just as a thought experiment, endangered species act aside, and let's imagine a chimpanzee intentionally created with largely humanized brain cells, almost literally what happened in, in Planet of the Apes. We could end up with a human animal chimera uh, that seems an awful lot like a human being in a chimpanzee body. Uh, chimpanzees really already demonstrate a lot of the attributes that we do consider important, ethically speaking and morally speaking, for defining us as humans and special. Um, and, but how do we legally and ethically uh, distinguish this, this new chimerized being, that chimerized being that has all those attributes that we say have that moral value, whether it's linguistic ability, degree of self-awareness, a sense of past and future self, um, if a researcher was able to secure private funding for this initiative, what laws related to research would stop her from doing that research? Now, I'm sure a number of the really brilliant lawyers that are in the audience today can come up with some really cool, novel ideas to try to prevent this type of research from occurring. But you could also imagine that a research team doing a cursory review of the laws could um, make a very different determination in, in their approval of this type of research. So this is the potential reality of of, and what we're dealing with right now. And so in the next slides, I'm going to just do a very quick review of the, that petition that ALDF submitted, um, by, and Chris Berry in particular. Um, I hope he's watching right now. Um, and, uh, uh, and it seeks regulation protecting humid chimeras and proposes one place to do this line drawing um, that, that uh, they thought was appropriate. Um, I'm also going to discuss where Neves is going to differ a little bit from ALDF on this proposal um, and why I think that there's some conversation that's really ethically relevant and morally relevant to the tactile decision about where that line should be drawn. Um, so the question at the heart of ALDF's petition is why do we not owe human-animal chimeras with the cognitive capacity of human beings, essentially the Planet of the Apes example, the same level of protection owed to human beings under law? 
So ALDF citizen petition for rulemaking to protect those humanized chimeras under the uh, HSA relies on the context described in our, my previous slides, the HHS policy for protection of human research subjects, sometimes referred to as the common rule, um, which lays out rules designed to protect human subjects of research through the IRB oversight and proposes new regulations to protect human animal chimeras with the cognitive capacity of a normal adult human being. So on this slide, you can see the legal protections that would apply to human animal chimeras if regulated under the petition. Um, this, as you can see, would be a tremendous advancement over the existing rules and laws that apply to, an to animals under the t this type of context, um, particularly and relevant to some of our conversations around ethics from earlier in the day. Um, there would be approval if only uh, among other requirements, there's, there's some sort of consideration of consent or, um, or that there's initial review and continuing review by an IRB-like panel. So ALDF noted in their petition that HHS had done little to ensure that there was enough protection for these types of animals and the type of research that was occurring. They certainly did not ensure that these types of individuals received appropriate treatment as human research subjects. Um, they also said that the narrow prohibitions on research involving non-human primate blastocysts and breeding chimeras would not necessarily prevent the creation of them. Um, it does not afford protection to those humanized chimeras and does not prohibit research with a relatively high risk of creating them. Finally, they acknowledge that some chimeras are protected as animals under the AWA, uh, but the AWA, of course, doesn't protect rats, mice, or birds. Um, although it does sound like we may be able to negotiate on some of these things moving forward. Um, all, of the, all of those animals, of course, are used frequently in research, um, but more importantly, it certainly doesn't protect most of those animals against invasive research involving intentional harm or more than minimal risk in the same way that human research protections would be, um, would be there under law. So ALDF's petition essentially sought to line draw up the high-level cognitive capacity standard for humanized uh, research subjects and argue that it's an ethical minimum. Uh, Neves, I think, would probably do something more than that, and I'll get to that in just a second. But here is, are some of the key criteria of that petition's proposal. First, that the humanized chimera should have the same protections as human research subjects. Um, if during IRB review there was found to be substantial risk that the subject will become or has obtained human uh, chimera status, humanized chimera status, it shall require researchers to reduce risks, um, and that there should be IRB monitoring of the human animal chimera testing, even if it's initially determined that there's no substantial risk of chimerization. <clears throat> Uh, within the framework of the guides, NIH could also include a prohibition on research including, uh, involving human-animal chimera as uh, demonstrating substantially enhanced, uh, substantively enhanced cognition and effective monitoring of chimera research. So this is something more what, like, Neves would end up supporting in this type of proposal. <clears throat> Or substantively enhanced is defined as mental ability sub substantively increased from animal baselines and attributable, attributable to human genetic material. Essentially, the position we'd be taking is that if, fine, taking you, taking you at your ethical framework, even if you believe it's the fact of our humanness that makes, that gives us these types of rights, um, our argument then is that the insertion of this type of human genetic material into animals inherently inscribes those beings with those same rights that we owe to humans. Um, at this stage, HHS, HHS hasn't responded to ALDF's rulemaking petition. I'm sure that uh, eventually the lack of response will lead to some sort of unreasonable delay litigation. Um, it has not been uh, instigated at this stage that I'm aware of, um, but I'm, I look forward to seeing how that plays out moving forward. Um, and Neves, of course, will be advocating for a precautionary approach as laid out in this situation. Uh, I also wanted to touch very quickly on CRISPR. Uh, we've talked a little bit about CRISPR here today, um, and I know that there's been a ton of conversation about CRISPR in some of the previous um, uh, workshops that have been held around some of this stuff. Um, so, so one of the challenges that I wanted to highlight with CRISPR in particular that hasn't already been talked about already is some of these interdependencies that exist between some of the research laws, some of the environmental laws, um, and, and then finally talk about some of the, uh, the issues around pain um, that we would love to be able to talk about further. 
So at the end of last year, a Chinese firm cloned a puppy named Long Long from another dog named Apple, whose genome had been edited to develop the disease arteriosclerosis. Um, Long Long is the, first, the world's first dog cloned from a gene-edited donor um, who is designed to have a serious disease. So this example highlights how CRISPR can be used to make, both make animals sick and make more sick animals, both of which clearly have all sorts of ethical considerations associated with them. Um, and all this is covered only by our existing laws and regulations uh, and haven't been caught up to new risks posed by these technologies, um, especially as we're noting that a lot of this research is occurring outside of the United States. In the U.S. context, it's like that most animals being experimented, experimented on using CRISPR technology would be mice and rats, animals exempt from the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and I think we saw that to be true uh, with one of the earlier presentations. But to what extent should we be adopting new types of laws or regulations that anticipates CRISPR being used for ethically questionable means, such as design, very designed companion animals or, or even things like de-extinction? Um, just, I, I know this was talked about briefly already, but um, just to reiterate, this isn't just true for farmed animals, but this type of technology has tremendous risks associated with off-target editing, which may have very serious animal welfare impacts. Uh, it may do things like reduce genetic diversity if it's, if it's applied to things like crops, uh, and it has tremendous potential for environmental damage uh, in ways that I think Ken was referring to in, in his presentation just a few minutes ago. Um, especially if gene-edited materials spread to closely related populations. <clears throat> um, and then uh, just to note that, you know, there's also, there's also really funky legal considerations that might come up here. What do we do if we bring back the woolly mammoth? Is it, do we have to go through ESA listing petitions? Uh, if we want to do reintroduction of these animals into the wild, do we have to use CITES permitting structures to get those things back in? Um, we, we don't know exactly how the interaction of these things work, um, and it's really too early to start, to start thinking about those things in reality. Um, finally, I do want to spend just a couple minutes talking about um, uh, some of the conversations that have occurred around eliminating an animal's ability to feel pain. Um, the arguments essentially, if we're going to have these use-based industries like factory farming or animal research, uh, the least we can do is eliminate the unpleasantness of the pain in the animals that must live and die on those farms and in those labs. In this study, mice with their global NAV 1.7 function knocked out are completely, were completely subject to uh, loss of acute pain perception. Uh, the mice were completely insensitized to painful tactile, thermal, and chemical stimulus. And, and interestingly, this probably makes more sense to some of the geneticists in the room. They had no sense of smell. Um, but while acute pain perception is a key factor in animal welfare, those considerations take no account of the emotional or psychological well-being of those animals. Uh, suffering and pain, I'd like to say, are, are not equivalent uh, moral constructs. And emotional and psychological well-being should be a key consideration of, our, of how we treat animals. We, in our organization and across the animal protection community, see the psychological suffering and, and, and PTSD-like symptoms of animals that have been rescued and, and brought to sanctuary from some of these research facilities. Um, and so our contention is we shouldn't be focusing on knocking out pain while we keep these animals in conditions that are incredibly damaging from a psychological well-being perspective. So I get the thought. I believe it was misguided, and I truly hope we can stop discussing this as a, as a significant way forward for reducing um, the suffering of animals. Um, but I think probably most importantly as part of this conversation, uh, there's a lot that we're looking out for, and there's a lot that we're going to have really robust ethical and legal conversations about over the next years as some of this technology advances. Um, I do want to, again, highlight a number of areas where I think that there is some overlap and opportunity for collaboration moving forward. Uh, we do think that there's opportunity to join together to adjust the existing regulatory uh, system to reduce the compliance burden on researchers and increase the protection of animals through, for example, uh, bringing back coverage of mice, rats, birds, and fish through the PHS policy and aligning on a harmonized system that does that. Aligning agency reporting, harmonizing agency reporting requirements and inspection requirements, reasonable suggestion, one that we would support so long as animals do not receive lower levels of protection, uh, private or public oversight or public transparency. 
And of course, we're incredibly excited about the development of alternatives to animal testing. Uh, from high throughput computational models, organs on chips, and more, we think there's an incredibly valuable market for alternative products that will ultimately be cheaper and more effective than animal methods. And over the next years, Neves is going to be working towards building investment in that field of alternatives. Um, and we hope that it will ultimately bring more resources to that field, both from the traditional funders of that type of work and also from those people who traditionally fund animal uh, welfare and animal rights types of works. Um, and sure, there may even be some sort of clean meat type of um, solution to, this pro to these uh, challenges. Oh, I, I didn't realize I hadn't switched the slides. Um, uh, there's the clean meat right there. Um, for the world of alternatives that replicates the human and animal biology, but it's grown in vitro without the capacity to suffer in any way. So we need to agree to not to see each other as the enemy. I don't think we are the enemy. Uh, we can disagree and we can collaborate all at the same time and work towards our respective visions for the future. Uh, a world where both humans and animals suffer less. So thank you all for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity for being here, uh, and I look forward to continuing this conversation moving forward. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. It was a fascinating uh, uh, discussion, I thought. Uh, we've got a microphone that we passed around. I've got at least one question from um, an internet audience member. I would like to start off with a question for Professor Tannenbaum. Um, with the different possible approaches that you mentioned uh, to who makes the uh, ethics decisions uh, uh, with regard to studies, which of those options do you prefer and which do you think is the most likely, understanding that those two may not be the same thing? Okay. I thought you might ask me that question. Some of you may not want to hear this if you participate in study research groups, but I think that maybe at that level some of these decisions ought to be made because my own view is that the key to good ethics in animal research is sound science, sound science. That in the vast majority of cases the, the goals are ethically appropriate. It's the science that's the key link between potential benefits um, and the aims. But I, I really don't want to endorse any approach yet, because we really haven't considered this seriously, but whatever group or whoever considers this is going to have to have sufficient scientific expertise, sufficient scientific expertise. Great. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Okay. Hi. Uh, oh, could you please give your, give your name yeah, before you? Feldo. Thank uh, you. Needs, but also in this case, I'm a psychologist who's uh, spent a lot of time looking at trauma in animals and labs. And I think the word ethical is kind of become a very cold, sterile world, word in a lot of today's discussion. I think when we think ethical, when we in the animal community think ethical, we think uh, welfare, humane. And what we're really happy about is that, again, the scientific community is giving us the scientific arguments as to why the humane welfare, not suffering, no stress uh, considerations that we've always had are incredibly important scientifically. Sapolsky, for example, because yeah. his whole career is built on how if the animal is stressed, you're not, by definition, doing good research. So I want to I make that point that ethics, humane welfare have to always be considered and are the, the Gemini twin sister of scientific validity. And, and, uh, and with that, I, at a conference here in, at the, on the Animal Welfare Act, uh, somebody proposed the issue of knocking out pain, knocking out the pain receptor. And I could see everybody in the audience who was in animal research, animal community as well as researchers gasp at that concept because it singly avoids the question of consciousness. Harvard had a conference a couple of springs ago on consciousness. And, and so to imagine being subjected to invasive procedures without the ability to feel pain and respond to that, which is Mother Nature's way of keeping you alive, is, is tantamount to probably the most cruel solution. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cruel solution. It's not part of... Um, it's, it's part of the problem, not the solution. And I'm going to give one tiny example. 
a chimpanzee at Fauna Sanctuary. His name was Tom. He was caught in the wild. He lived 30 years in a 5 by 5 by 7 cell uh, at different laboratories. He had severe injury to a left foot as part of the laboratory, and his foot was pink. As part of the enrichment, they would give the chimps watercolors to play with, and all the, chim the chimps would pick a yellow, a green, an orange. Tom started to, to go, no, 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 and he wanted the black. And what he did was he took the black and he proceeded to paint his pink foot black. And he did that for two solid weeks, and then he stopped doing it. And I think with all the research on consciousness, I think that's a clear example of the level of awareness that animals have that's simply not making them feel pain, which we've been trying to do with analgesics and anesthesia for decades, is not a solution to animal welfare. And obviously, I feel strongly about this as an animal advocate. Just, just go ahead and pass it back. Uh, Ken Oy from MIT. Um, a question to Nathan. Uh, you were talking about new technologies that could reduce reliance on, let's call it, varieties of animal testing and animal trials. Um, you were mentioning, for example, the use of um, programmable organoids or cell cultures. And a lot of this stuff emerges from synthetic biology, and it is very promising. That noted validation of these methods will be required which probably means a period where the new methods, old animal testing, and human endpoints are all going to be kind of aligned in a big mess. The question that I have is, what advice do you have for how to manage what you hope will be a transition? I don't know if it's going to end everything, but clearly there's promise here. But what advice do you have for managing the transition for validation probably involving animals? is going to be part of the picture. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an incredibly challenging one for an organization that's focused on ending animals. And so you're essentially doing uh, a balancing, a weighting of the, of the potential harms and benefits of each of those two things in your head from a moral perspective. Um, I don't, have, I don't have a recommendation here, but I do have uh, something that we're seeing right now in the, in the development of alternatives to... to um, uh, animal products for for consumption is that they, they they're experiencing the types of, of uh, development challenges that you're talking about right now there's an increasing number of companies um, Hampton Creek and um, um, and others uh, beyond meats and others that are subject to the existing rules for um, for getting certifications associated with those food products and and those traditional, those traditional avenues for doing that type of work includes animal testing. I know that PETA has been, um, has been involved in some of these conversations with, with some of these companies to date. Um, it's a really challenging issue. Uh, I, I wish that I had a clear, a clear and, and substantive way of moving through those types of conversations. Um, in the end, we want to get to that vision of the future as quickly as possible, um, and we recognize that's a messy process. Um, and uh, I think that's about all I can say about that to, to date. Um, yeah. Uh, Carolyn Connolly. I'd like uh, either or both of you to comment on the uh, recent report of a cloning of a primate in China, and it was uh, supposedly said that this is going to benefit research. Could you speak to the ethics or the, you know, the, the reasoning behind it, and whether you think this would benefit research in some way? Um, so I haven't. I actually haven't read. I saw the news article, of course. Um, so I don't. I don't know exactly what they're talking about. But one of the things that. Um, that jumped out. Of, of course, we're we're opposed to this type of research, just gen generally speaking. Um, uh, but but I do think the the thing that that jumped out to me with that is is some of the conversations that we were having earlier today about what what is the what are the outcomes that we're trying to seek with some of these things. Um, it, it was hard for me to guess at what the objectives of that type of research was. Um, are we just trying to show that we can do some of these things? Um, that's potentially challenging. Uh, and, and then I think more fundamentally from a moral perspective, you very quickly get it. If you're doing it for, for the reasons that I sort of showed through that study from at the beginning of last year, you, we are getting into this ethically questionable zone of creating more sick animals um, or just creating more animals that are going to be suffering, both of which have serious ethical considerations.
Uh, Rick Bourne from Harvard Medical School. I have a question for Professor Tannenbaum, and it relates to this distinction between you know, full ethical review and partial ethical review and where the law is and where the ayakak is. So thinking about your example about the emphysema in monkeys, I was thinking back to the, one of the slides I showed where I had the three justifications that we're all required to, which is justify why you need to use animals at all. The number three was the numbers, but number two was justification of the species that you're choosing. And I think that would have been where our ayakak would have dealt with that issue that is ethical, but it's, so it's why do you need to use monkeys and not mice or not fruit flies? Um, and so I'm just curious as to, is that an example in your mind of, of ayakak overreach? Because it's getting close. Um, it's getting close um, because in, in, in that kind of case, at least typically, I think, the IACUC is not evaluating the aims or the goals of the research. Um, it's saying, given the aims and goals of research, at least this is what, now, as I said, what I said initially is that some people have questioned whether this distinction makes sense, and I do understand that. But given the goals of the research, um, and what the, the, the investigator thinks the science is, would that be an appropriate species? But for example, considering whether the sophisticated animal like a monkey ought to be used in any kind of research or any kind of tobacco research, that would be a, at, a, at a different level. But I do understand what you're saying, and that's why I called limited, limited ethical review. Uh, Pat Brown from NIH. I just wanted to read um, for you the change that was made to the requirements for the vertebrate and animal section of grant applications to NIH. This was made uh, for all applications um, since 2016. One of the requirements is for justifications, and the current language says, provide justification that the species are appropriate for the proposed research. Explain why the research goals cannot be accomplished using an alternative model, e.g. computational, human, invertebrate, and in vitro. And then I took this path in order to emphasize the importance of investigators exploring at the time of preparation of the application, consider, true consideration of, of uh, alternatives. The past language was nowhere to yep. that level of, of strength or, or de definition. Um, I actually had a feeling Pat would ask that question. Um, I have problems with what the NIH has done in terms of its adherence to the statutory intent. I do. Um, but also there are ways of looking at that um, that don't involve really fundamental ethical questions like whether certain kinds of research are, are appropriate at all. But it's because the VIS is, is to be looked at by the study groups. That's one of the reasons why I feel better about them doing some of this, some of, some of this ethical review. Uh, you may not be aware of the details of wh where this comes from, but the mm -hmm. PHS policy has specific language no, I about what has to be in applications, well, uh, and that was the yeah. basis for, yeah. and also the U.S. government well, principles, which no, are well, also me, I, part of the Public Health Service I, I'm Act. Gonna ha I'm going to have to say something about that, about okay. the legislative history. Um, what happened, and I do explain it in detail, was that when Congress enacted the HREA, it directed uh, the, the NIH to promulgate standards. What the NIH did was to adopt the public, the, the public health service policy, which were, was already in existence for intramural research, and as it was. And the, uh, included in the public health service policy was principle two. So the question, and again, it's a question, and we may have litigation about this, I don't know, is whether the use of principle two, which is the key, and some of the other things that in the public health service policy are permitted under the original congressional intent that asked the NIH to apply the public health service, uh, to promulgate standards. This is a very technical and difficult uh, legal issue. I've made the case, as I said in my chapter, and you may disagree with it, you probably will, uh, because it, at stake here really is uh, whether already in the law there is the requirement of ethical review. But let me just say one thing. 
if you're right in the sense that the NIH does ha and OLA does have authority under the public health service policy to require this really strong ethical review, the question really is what standards do we have? And have you in OLA promulgated standards or will promulgate standards that will help resolve some of these ethical disagreements that will in fact or could in fact occur? So it doesn't really obviate the basic questions, the basic problems uh, that I raise. Our position has been, and will most likely continue to be, that, that there, there, are, there are two efforts going on. One, at the time of, of the peer review process, and that's the scientific merit, and that includes possibly human subjects research and animal research, or some combination. Um, and then the IACUC review, or the IRB review, if the work is to be funded. So it's a, it, it is a continuous process, and there may be some overlap, but, I, but, I, but there are steps along the way that should be um, giving people confidence that there is a thoughtful process going on. Now, it's very interesting. I think, again, I don't want to get into battle we, because we're friends. We are. And we're both after the same things. But the USDA has taken a very different approach to this business. Um, and in fact, if you look at the USDA's definition of alternatives in Policy 12, they follow and track the statute, the Animal Welfare Act, very carefully and say that in order, um, if, if, if alt alternatives by definition must be consistent with project aims and goals, which is what the Congress had intended initially both in the, the AWA and in the HRA. But this is to be continued, I promise. I know it will be. <laughs> and along the lines of continuation, I was planning to say one more question, but that very interesting dialogue uh, w w took up that, that, that time and I think was probably useful. So uh, this is the end of our time, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to our outstanding panelists.